gentle, and of course, very modern apes. Today we're doing something a little different. This is going to be a pretty unscripted video, but I kind of needed some content, dog hair. I kind of needed some content, and so I, uh, I was inspired this morning, as usual, by scrolling through Twitter. That's nasty. So I wake up, it's Easter, I'm scrolling through Twitter, and I see a tweet from a one Frank Turek. Now, for those of you who maybe don't know, Frank Turek is an apologist. I'm in my incognito window here, but just so you know, I also don't follow Frank in real life, and yet he still continually gets his tweets kind of pushed in my face, which I, I don't like that, but uh, today I saw a tweet by him, and we're going to scroll down to it past, excellent, he wrote an article for Fox News, uh, there's something about mama bear sexuality. I'm sure that that is very, uh, very normal, very uh, appropriate. Um, shilling for his cross-examined app. And eventually, as you can see, he's a bit terminally online. He's tweeting like constantly. But we get to this. It's an Emperor's New Groove meme. Uh, and I, I laughed at this. Uh, it's Yzma. She's like, he's still alive? And that's the chief priest. And then Kronk is like, well, he's not as dead as we would have hoped. And that's like the Roman guard. So I, I chuckled at this, despite the fact that it is just smack dab slapped with the cross-examined logo and that it says Happy Easter at the top. So I was like, this is pretty funny. And then I thought, it's too funny. There's no way Frank made this up by himself. So I just, I simply Googled uh, that he's alive while well, he's not as, dead as we, as, not as dead as we'd hoped. And I was greeted with tons of other memes that are effectively identical that were made before Frank made them. So um, he has effectively, I suppose, uh, yoinked this meme and taken credit for it. Now, as we all know here on the internet, meme theft is a very serious crime. And I was reminded how frequently Frank Turek irritates me as I saw this, a, a classic, a classic bamboozle where I think that he can do something somewhat reasonable, uh, and then I find out that it is a vintage Easter recipe. Oh God, is that aspic? That is disgusting. I accidentally clicked on that. Sorry, guys. I'm back on. And again, this is very unscripted. It was reminded how much Frank Turek kind of irritates me, right? So uh, I thought what we would do is just kind of like consume some Frank Turek media, and then I will of course, react to it in YouTube fashion. So I don't actually know that much about Frank Turek other than the hot takes from him I've seen on Twitter and then sort of people reacting to those hot takes and the odd reaction video to some dumb nonsense that he has said on YouTube. As you can tell, I already have feelings, uh, but we're going to get into those a bit later. First, let's, let's check out some of these Frank Turk tabs that I've got in the background so we can kind of immerse ourselves in the Frank Turk universe. So he's an apologist, duh. I know that's a shocker. His credentials are kind of apologetics adjacent. I believe he's got like a doctorate in divinity. Um, I've scanned this already, but I thought we would kind of take a, take a more, a slower stroll through this Wikipedia page together. So naturally, he's the guy who's in charge of cross-examined, that sort of meme-stealing Twitter page that I showed you just moments before. Um, and cross-examined is known for its quippy, if vapid, uh, little takes. So that's nice. We'll, I'm sure we'll be talking a little bit about that later. So he's co-authored two books, Legislating Morality. Uh, wonder what that's about. And I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, a classic line. But he's also authored in two of his own books, including correct, not politically correct. And uh, spoiler, the full title is actually correct, not politically correct, how same-sex marriage hurts everyone. Well, just as I thought, trash. So this is the kind of guy that we're kind of evaluating here. We'll talk more about that in a second too, I'm sure. And then he also co-authored a book called Stealing from God, which you would imagine that someone like God would, would be capable of preventing theft, but, and you know, bold of Frank Turek, known meme stealer to talk about stealing from God. Uh, those are equivalent crimes as far as I'm concerned. I'm kidding. Uh, he also hosts, um, cross-examined a talk show on American Family Radio. So let's learn a little bit about his background. He's got a Master of Public Administration and a Doctorate of Ministry 
which of course makes him very well equipped to be uh, a critic of macro evolution. <laughs> um, awesome. He's an intelligent design advocate. We will see more of that in a second. He's very vocal about that, but in kind of a funny way, you'll, you'll see what I mean. So continuing downwards, let's talk about his, uh, his thoughts on marriage. He thinks marriage lengthens the lifespan of men and women. Okay, sure, whatever. Civilizes men. It's a little, a little sexist there, Frank. Think men aren't civilized? Think women are naturally more civilized than men? Uh, protects women, I see. Marriage, of course, protects women. Um, this is quite strange to me, and of course, certainly not supported because anthropologically speaking, hunter-gatherer societies don't necessarily institute marriage into their sort of social groups. And there are women in there, and they seem to be doing just fine. Protects mothers, lowers welfare costs, and encourages replacement birth rate. There it is. Awesome. And he argues same-sex marriage does none of these. All right. Cool. Um, bobbing over to the cross-examined website, there are a couple of articles of note that I want to touch on because I think they kind of elucidate the Turek perspective. The first is on talking snakes and donkeys, where I don't think Turek is actually the author of this blog post, but he did put it on his, like, blog section, so clearly it's got, like, the, the, the Turek-approved checkmark. But I think this is a really interesting article because the author of the blog basically wrote it because they're lamenting that people find the fact that there are talking snakes and talking donkeys in the Bible as like a point against taking it literally. And fine, whatever. But that's kind of not part of the point that I'm trying to make here. The real interesting thing is the response to this challenge, where instead of, you know, taking kind of the reasonable stance and saying, well, maybe some of it is allegorical, or maybe it's meant to teach a lesson, or, you know, it's it's not literally saying that they're talking snakes and talking donkeys, whatever, the, the, the reasonable Christian response. Instead, it says, so what? If God created the universe, then he can make donkeys or snakes talk if he feels like it, miraculously speaking. And that's going to become a very constant recurring theme with Frank Turek, this sort of anytime there is a problem, it's miraculous. So what? If God feels like making it a miracle, then he's just going to make it a miracle. And that's just something that you, the scientists or other types of Christians are going to have to deal with. The other article that I just wanted to touch on is this one titled, Everyone Believes Something Unbelievable. And then they provide the following list of proposed unbelievable things, including Virgin birth, abiogenesis, resurrection from the dead, random mutations producing the raw material for new organs, intelligent creation ex nihilo, eternal matter, eternal mind, heaven, multiverses, etc. So what he's doing here is he's taking sort of three categories, right? Miraculous things in the Bible, unanswered questions in science, and proven things in science, and he's equating them all under the umbrella unbelievable. Right. Just because you don't understand something doesn't mean it's unbelievable. Right. We know that random, quote unquote, mutations do produce the quote unquote raw material for new organs. And we can go over that a little bit later. But I find it very strange that and I guess not strange. <laughs> I find it very interesting that he feels the need to sort of equalize these things out, because if he can put these two things on the same playing field, then he can just play the miracle trump card for his stuff and then point at the sort of science affirming Christians and the whatever atheist agnostics, whatever you want to call them, conventional science community and say, see, you can't invoke miracles for this. But an unanswered science question is not the same thing as something that is miraculous, right? We don't know how life could come from sort of organic soups just yet, although recent work has suggested we're kind of on our way. But that's kind of a different thing than a virgin birth, right? But miracles being just a regular thing that happens and also science having impossible things and impossible things, you can just read that little asterisk, read that as unanswered questions are going to be sort of the way that Frank Turek views scientific questions in general. Moving on over, we can check out Frank Turek's impeccable merch store where we have a contradict shirt, very tasteful, that is, I guess, supposed to be a dunk on the classic coexist bumper stickers. We have the scientism fail meme edition. And if you click on it, uh, you can get a good look at what it 
what it is. It's called Manga Apologetics. I'll throw myself into oncoming traffic if I have to read that sentence ever again. And you've got the woman who says, science can prove everything. And then the man, who is of course much smarter, says, really? Can you prove that statement with science? And then she goes, say what? Uh? Uh? What? This is Frank Turek single-handedly owning science again. Classic. Uh, and he's got some other sort of, I guess you would call it cringe <laughs> um, stuff here. We've got unlucky atheist knight. Atheists ready to fight Christians and their god is like the air argument. And then he gets whack, right? An arrow right in the eye socket. And then it says, Kalam fine tuning and moral argument. <laughs> okay. <laughs> really top notch stuff here. Uh, but keep all of this in mind because it's certainly going to be a core theme in Frank Turek's discussion regarding evolution, which is of course why we're here, because I don't touch philosophy with a 30-foot pole, because I'm too stupid to do it. <laughs> with those lay epic memes out of the way, I thought you might appreciate what <laughs> my incognito YouTube suggested looks like after viewing exactly one Frank Turek video, uh, and it's this. We have video suggestions like Mark Zuckerberg knows more about the Bible than you think with one of those <gasps> emojis. Uh, and they just, they picked the picture of Mark that makes him look like a lizard, which I don't know why they picked that one. And then we've also got another suggested video titled Jordan Peterson's realization about the Bible uh, with a nice picture of like that, the classic made fun of white Jesus image right there in the middle. The joke being if Jesus is a Middle Eastern man, he, he probably wouldn't have looked like this. Which is great. Some real, some real top-notch suggestions. I guess we did get uh, McDonald's Pakistan versus India epic fast food showdown, which is nice. And uh, any other good ones? Ooh, Jeremy Wade finds giant crayfish. Now this I would watch. This I would watch. Don't you know the first video we have to watch when Googling Frank Turek evolution or YouTubing, I guess you would say? I guess that's the verb you would use. YouTubing Frank Turek evolution is this video titled, Why Are So Many Scientists Evolutionists? And if you scroll down into the description box, the reason why there are too many scientists evolutionists. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let's watch this and appreciate Frank's response. It's only two minutes. If scientists, um, scholars, whatnot, if they're so smart and they really want the truth, why are they so married to evolution when there are so many, you know, strong arguments um, that go against them? I <laughs> that lady in the green in the back is looking around. She's like, uh, wait a second. <laughs> this, this is kind of dumb. Is anybody else thinking this is kind of dumb? I, I, there's probably a number of reasons that people believe in macroevolution. They've been taught it. They, it's it's the best um, explanation from a naturalistic perspective we have even. Uh, quick note here, macroevolution includes things like speciation, which have been observed in the present. So Frank does not know the terms that he's using here. Uh, he's using the classic outdated ID whiny buzzwords like, I believe in microevolution, but macroevolution is impossible without knowing that like macroevolution, that's just speciation, right? Change between species though it's got a lot of holes in it. Um, and also, it's based on a worldview that miracles don't occur. Boom, right there, baby. That's what we're going to be uh, getting a lot of with old Frank Turek. It's based on the assumption that miracles don't happen. Yes, Frank, that is how science works. Even creationist scientists, like the ones that work at AIG, don't assume miracles when they're like trying to prove their point because they want to show that something has support for it in a naturalistic way. If you can just assume that miracles can be implemented whenever and wherever you may please, it ceases to be falsifiable, right? So this is the problem with invoking miracles. This is the reason why even the, the oldest of old scientists in yielden days 
wouldn't assume miraculous things. It, they're presupposing that God doesn't exist. The science presupposes absolutely nothing about God. It just simply assumes that when something is occurring in nature, it is under the laws and theories that operate within nature to the exclusion of physics breaking deities coming in and breaking physics in order to make something happen. That's all. And they, they have to operate that way when they go into the laboratory, they think. They have to have this, what's called methodological naturalism. That so in Frank's view then, going into the laboratory, you can just assume that something miraculous may happen when you're like running <laughs> electrolysis, right? That's, that's silly. No, no one would propose this. And this is very, this betrays Frank's lack of experience in anything even science adjacent. That they have their method when they do science presupposes that there's no intelligence out there. Okay? And so when they're looking for a cause, they're always going to assume it's a natural cause, even if the evidence points to an intelligent being. So it's more. How, <laughs> how would you even set up what evidence for an intelligent being would look like? We've talked about this on the channel before, but this is one of the reasons why intelligent design is not scientific. There is no set of criteria, there's no model that they can actually test. It's just vaguely gesturing at things that look complicated and saying, well, I guess someone who's smarter than me must have done this, a, a great cosmic deity. Um, it's lazy. More of a philosophical presupposition than it is based on interpreting the evidence properly. And in the book, Stealing from God, we have a chapter on science. The title of the chapter is, Science Doesn't Say Anything. Scientists do. You see, all data needs to be gathered, all data needs to be interpreted, and that's what scientists do, not science. So, this is just such a weird concept to me, that miracles always need to be on the table and always need to be considered, that God is constantly capable of tinkering and messing with your results, whether you're running an experiment on Drosophila fruit flies and trying to examine how mutation rates function in a population of them at like a postgraduate level, or whether you're a sixth grader studying Newtonian physics that God is constantly capable of and that we as scientists need to account for the possibility of tinkering. That's really, really, really bonkers, especially because there's no precedence for it. Right? There's no reason why we need to account for this. It, we don't have any record of physics constantly fluctuating here in the modern day in such a fashion that a cosmic deity is influencing our results. So perhaps that's the reason, Frank. And perhaps that's the reason that, again, even the young earth creationists aren't assuming that miracles are constantly on the table. You have to operate that way when they go into the laboratory they think, they have to have this, what's called methodological naturalism. It's not methodological naturalism to, <laughs> to assume that physics is functioning in a consistent fashion through space and time. That they have, their method when they do science presupposes that there's no intelligence out there, okay? And so when they're looking for a cause, they're always gonna assume it's a natural cause, even if the evidence points to an intelligent being. I've said it before and I've said it again, uh, intelligent design is not scientific. There is no model for it. There's no criteria by which we can actually detect design. And modern intelligent design has become so analogous to natural processes that there's, as far as I'm aware, no way to say this was done by design and this was done by sort of the, the processes that evolution is capable of. And the reason I put evolution in quotes is because oftentimes these intelligent design advocates will say things along the lines of, well, you know, there can be some change in organisms, but not too much change. But they can't tell you where that line is, and thus there is no way to distinguish between normal evolutionary mechanisms creating some kind of variation in a population, or selecting for a certain kind of uh, phenotype, or God tinkering and involving himself in the process. Thus, it's unfalsifiable. There's no model to it. It's, it's just, I mean, I could go on and on and on, and I have before on this channel. And there are many creationists of the ID variety and of the creation, young earth creationist variety who will say the same thing. They'll say, yeah, intelligent design, it's not science in the conventional sense. 
Turk doesn't seem to know this, but again, Turk also seems to think that scientists should take miracles into account when we're running, you know, <laughs> basic experiments in a lab, which is kind of crazy. So it's more of a philosophical presupposition than it is based on interpreting the evidence properly. And in the book, Stealing from God, we have a- I'm sure Frank could tell us how to interpret the evidence properly. I'm sure that he has figured this out, which is why he's publishing so much on it. Chapter on science. The title of the chapter is Science Doesn't Say Anything. Scientists do. You see, all data needs to be gathered. All data needs to be interpreted. And that's what scientists do, not- This is true. Scientists do interpret data, but the- <laughs> The part that's tough about that is sometimes there is only one way to interpret the data and stay in line with, like, again, the laws of physics, right? So when we radiometrically date something, for instance, it is interpretation to look at the data, to look at the ratio of parent to daughter material, but there's only one way to interpret it, unless you're going to invoke, again, physics-defying physics -defying, never-before-seen processes. In conventional science, you would look at, you know, say, um, say we're looking at argon-argon dating and we get, you know, a date of 2.5 million years based on the parent to daughter ratio. You are interpreting that data because interpretation is basically anybody looking at it and drawing a conclusion from it. But there is no way to look at that parent to daughter ratio and say it's anything other than 2 million years has passed since or 2 million years worth of parent has decayed into daughter, unless you're invoking something, frankly, frankly, get it? Magical. Not science. And that's why when you hear somebody on TV saying science says we have to, no, science doesn't say a word. Scientists, I just saw a headline today, it said something like, uh, and I don't care what you, the, the, whether you think global climate change oh, is true God. or not, that's not my point. But the point is it said we have 12 years before we're going to, if we don't do something about climate change, um, be, 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 before the end. Doomsday, right? Well, you know, people said that stuff in the 1970s. Oh boy. Frank. Frank, we gotta talk about this. So Frank's already said some pretty dumb stuff in this video, but he has officially entered into the goofball zone. We've already established that interpretation has to happen for all data. That's just how analysis works. And we've also established that once data is collected and analyzed, Oftentimes, there is only one way to interpret the data that is consistent with the way physics, chemistry, and biology typically work. So how exactly does that apply to climate change? Now, it should come as no surprise to you that Frank Turek's opinion on climate change is brain dead. We've been modeling climate change again since the 70s, and probably quite a bit earlier given most of our oil companies did research on climate change given the fact that they are responsible for a lot of it and found that it's been happening and would continue to happen as long as they continued their activities unabated. They then did nothing about it. But I digress. We've been doing climate research for quite some time, and while projections and prognosis has changed here and there, one thing has remained overwhelmingly consistent. It's getting hotter, and weather events are getting more extreme. I'm going to compare this to the science of medicine for a moment. We have had for a long time the ability to tell whether or not someone has cancer. What has become quite a bit more precise as technology has improved is our ability to guess how long someone has and how they're going to respond to treatment. The same is true for climate change. It has gotten hotter since those models in the 70s, just like every single one of them predicted and every single model since then has continued to predict. Similarly, the oceans are acidifying. We've seen entire reefs collapse. The Great Barrier Reef looks nothing like it did in the 70s today. The whole thing is bleached. Weather events have gotten more extreme all over the planet. It actually surprises me that Frank Turek has this take even in 2019, given the majority of even the more conservative news outlets today understand that climate change is happening. But I guess Frank Turek is as behind on his climate change hot takes as he is on his meme usage. Epic fail, my friend. And then in the 1980s, and then in the 1990s, and then the 2000s, they keep saying, we got 10 years, 12 years, and here we still are, right? It's not science that's telling us this, it's scientists, and they may have it wrong. Oh, okay. 
All right, so his entire hot take here, his entire response to why are so many scientists evolutionists is that they might just actually be wrong. <laughs> In his humble opinion, really good stuff, really big-brained take. And how apt in what is fixing to be the hottest year on record for Frank to compare it to scientists being wrong on climate change. Going back over to the YouTube search results, we've got another couple of awesome Frank Turk takes when it comes to evolution. We've got him talking about whether or not it fits with the Bible. Spoiler alert, he says it doesn't. You've got, <laughs> you've got one titled, Evolution Needs God, if it was true. We've got an old universe doesn't help evolution. Watch this. If macro is macroevolution true and does it disprove Christianity? Again, what he's going to end up saying there is it's not true, but even if it was, it requires God. So this is Frank Turek sort of future-proofing himself as he continues to get spanked by evolutionary theory and theistic evolutionists in general. He's kind of saying, well, well maybe if it is true, fine, but, you know, I don't think it is, and if it is, it needs God. We've got, are there not enough anti-evolution biologists? Evolution can't explain morality. Um, and then I guess that's that's kind of it for, for cross-examined. I think it would be fun to watch some more of these videos. The question is, will we do it right now? The answer is actually yes, but I'll probably be in different clothes for that because I have to go to an Easter barbecue celebration. So it's actually a, a day and a half later because the Easter celebration, uh, got a little rowdy. Fortunately, I am charged with Easter power and ready to annihilate Frank Turek even more robustly than before. And yes, this is a, <laughs> this is a sweatshirt of a wave of lean with little sprite bottles in it uh, crashing. It's, it's the great wave painting, but with lean. I just thought it was a cool purple wave when I bought it years ago. It wasn't until it arrived that I saw the sprite bottles and I realized the error of my ways. But now it's 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 quite funny to wear it around. <laughs> Accidental paraphernalia purchases out of the way. Let us move on in our great journey, our great our great sampling of Frank Turek and Frank Turek adjacent content. For this next video, gotta be evolution needs God. If it was true, I like how sassy this is. Uh, Frank gets me every time with the jokes and with his his quick wit. And if you scroll down, you can see that in the description, it says, Checkmate, Christians. If evolution is true, Christianity is false. Well, not really. Even if microevolution was possible, it would need God to guide it. So, like, Frank accepts microevolution, though. <laughs> when shouldn't this be if macroevolution is true, it needs God to guide it? Isn't that kind of what we're going for here? Uh, fortunately, you can immediately, for more information, go to his social media, his resources, and subscribe to the podcast. Uh, hashtag evolution. Hashtag God. Hashtag intelligent design me. Hmm. Boy, I almost feel like there is a joke that one could make here. Frank's riled and ready to go, and so are we. Let's let him. There's irreducibly complex aspects to biology that seems to prevent a gradual, non-intelligent process that brings forth new body plans. Was that a, was that a, was this a 10 second intro to a two minute and 23 minute long video? What an excellent, spectacular waste of everyone's time. We'll get to what he said there. I'm sure he's going to repeat it in the actual video since this was... This was our preview of what is to come. So do you believe that things such as evolution were set in place by this well, higher power? 100% based. We love this guy. Uh, I love to hear that kind of thing. The, the theistic evolutionists are always repping, always making me happy. Um, I don't like his Under Armour shirt. It's pretty, uh, pretty cool stuff. There's a lot of problems with macroevolution. Now, when you use the word evolution, you need to define your term. Darwinian. Okay, if you mean change over time, everybody agrees with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now listen, you need to define your... Darwinian. This guy comes in sharp. I like that. And then Turk is like, Darwinian evolution, eh? I don't quite know what that means. 
Well, if you mean change over time, and then just he just runs with that. We 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 do like to see it. We like to see informed youths uh, verbally spanking um, ding dongs like Frank Turek. Christians, non Christians. If you mean micro evolution, adaptation within a type, everybody agrees with that. But if you micro adaptations within a type, boy. Doesn't that sound like a familiar term? It almost feels as though it's just a, a reskin, a reskin of the word kind. Boy, that would perhaps make one think that maybe intelligent design is just a reskin of something as well. Now, wouldn't it? I mean, macroevolution, molecules to man without intelligence. I not only think the evidence is not there for that, I think there's evidence against it. For example, the fossil record is one piece of evidence against it. The Cambrian explosion shows every major phy phyla come into existence without fossil precursors. Huh. Boy, that feels like something that's testable. I think that we could maybe look into that for just a moment, just a, a hair of a spell, and see if what Frank said there, we almost forgot the word phylum, uh, holds any water. So I want to show you some of the guys from the Cambrian, because something Frank said there is correct. I know, shock and awe. I was kind of floored too. But the Cambrian explosion does describe this very real diversification event that occurs after a period of time known as the Ediacaran. We'll talk about the Ediacaran in just a second. But first and foremost, I want to show you some cool Cambrian animals because I think they're awesome. Classically, we've got trilobites hanging out in the Cambrian. We've got weird little noodle nose dudes like Opabinia hanging out here. I hope you can see his weird little like grabby proboscis. This guy is awesome. Love him. 10 out of 10 would hug and protect with my life. We have oddballs like Hallucigenia, this individual right here. We still don't know which way is like with any for sure confidence, which way is up on this thing. It is so strange. And for this reason, I kind of like to jokingly refer to the Cambrian as like nature's deviant art stage because we're experimenting with a lot of different styles and most of them don't stick, which is fascinating to think about. Also, we see the emergence in the Cambrian of hard body parts, which is going to come into play when we discuss why it looks or has been characterized in the past like an explosion. Is it really an explosion or is it perhaps a sampling bias? Here are some other cool dudes. Look, you can buy figures of these guys, although this is a Eurypterid, so I don't know what it's doing with the Cambrian and like Ordovician guys here. It's okay. I'm over it. I'm, I'm not going to take it personally. I will, but not on camera. <laughs> so, you can look at all of these forms and say, okay, does Frank have a point though? Do they really appear, as he said, with virtually no precursors? And the answer to that is a definitive no. The time period prior to the Cambrian is a period known as the Ediacaran, as I mentioned earlier. And in the Ediacaran, we've got a ton of weird guys lurking around. Now, they are not as complicated as what we see in the Cambrian because, of course, they're not. When we have a, a sudden emergence of a bunch of brand new niches that open up, Critters seem to diversify a lot faster in order to take hold and exploit the resources available in all of these new areas or zones, if you will, where they can kind of specialize and, and really stand out, I guess, amongst other organisms, compete in new ways. And this is what we see in the modern day too, when new areas open up and animals can move in to these locations or plants can establish them in the case of islands, we see a whole bunch of adaptation and radiation where organisms are just kind of fooling around and experimenting. It's, it's really neat. So this period of the Ediacaran that precedes the Cambrian has these weird fleshy frond guys, Charnia, we've got Dickinsonia, all these weird mats and like Nadarians here, the, the sort of beginnings of these jellyfish. And what you'll notice when you see this picture and this is reflected, of course, when we look at the actual fossils, is that they're all soft-bodied. Nothing has any shells, nothing has any hard parts like mouths or teeth or beaks or anything complicated like that, which is why the Ediacaran is poorly represented when compared to the Cambrian, because it turns out soft things decompose a lot faster than hard things do, which means it's harder to actually get a representation of them. So is Frank Turk correct that we see massive radiation during the Cambrian? Yes. Is he correct in saying this appears out of nowhere with virtually no precursors, he is absolutely incorrect. And we've known this for quite some time. So I don't think that there is really any excuse to be saying that in this year of our Lord 2022. But maybe he has other good gripes. Come on, Frankie, show us something good. Number two, there's genetic limits to change. 
which appear to prohibit this kind of macroevolutionary change. I mean, breeders can't break genetic limits to change. Why should we expect non-intelligent processes to do so? They're How fascinating. These genetic limits, I've not heard of them. Boy, that feels like something that would be groundbreaking and very important to, <laughs> to spread around. The point here is that there are no genetic limits. Frank is gesturing vaguely to the fact that he's like doing a weird Kent Hovind argument where it's like, we don't get cows producing a non-cow. Clearly there are limits to genetic change. No, there aren't. Not that we know of. Yes, mutation and selection have to work with what is present. So any given time, new mutations come to light, they're either going to be selected for or against, or maybe not at all, if they're totally neutral and don't do anything to an organism. A mutation is going to create change for sure that selection can then act on, but mutations are usually changes on existing structures within the genome. So it's not going to be anything drastic overnight as far as like, I, Frank Turek, I imagine, would be like, I want to see, you know, a cow give birth to a lion. And it's like, yeah, that's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. But of course, evolution never predicted that it would. This is why we see slow change over geologic time in the fossil record. Boy, doesn't that kind of feel like, you know, a, a fulfilled prediction, if you will? There's something now known as epigenetic information, which is the structure of a cell, which you can't modify by mutations. So, no, <laughs> the, year, the year is 2020, and Frank Turek has just discovered epigenetic information. He tells the world, and the world stands still. So, epigenetics as a concept really started to gain some ground in like the 1990s, if memory serves. Uh, so we're at least 30 years out of date on this one. But moreover, that definition of epigenetics reminds me a little bit of like an undergraduate student who just got done taking their genetics final that they probably got like a C on. They go out to, you know, their local bar street, they get absolutely wasted, and then someone asks them, hey, what is epigenetics? And then they like do their best in a drunken stupor to explain it. I mean, he just said it's the structure of a cell that you can't modify with mutations. Epigenetics usually refers to like the, the nature of DNA regulation that happens like at a genomic level. Um, yeah, it impacts the cell, but I don't really think that most people talk about epigenetics in that sense. I guess I could be wrong, but it's going to be things like DNA methylation primarily. So I'm not really sure what he's talking about with this cell stuff. Moreover, epigenetics, no, they don't change by mutation, but they are heritable changes sometimes. So there's that. They are still impacting the overall sort of condition of a given population. Really wanted to double check myself on this one because as everyone here knows, I'm not a geneticist. So I went ahead and pulled up Epigenetics, the Science of Change, a 2006 paper, but what are you gonna do? And uh, it's, <laughs> It says the word epigenetic literally means in addition to ch in addition to changes in genetic sequence. The term has evolved to include any process that alters gene activity without changing the DNA sequence and leads to modifications that can be transmitted to daughter cells. Although experiments show that some epigenetic changes can be reversed. Um, lots of different processes: methylation, acetylation, phosphorylation. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. Ubiquitylation, ubiquitylation, and sumoliation. Cool. Um, but what I'm trying to say here, oh, and there's a nice, this is quite nice. For nearly a century after the term epigenetics first surfaced on the printed page. So, you know, like I said, we're really keeping up to date on things with old Frank Turek. So now that he's successfully gotten epigenetics wrong, or at least it doesn't seem like he understands it very well, let's continue. Uh, which shows that you could modify or mutate DNA from now till doomsday, you'll never get a new body plan. Why? Because DNA alone won't give you a new body plan. You need, need epigenetic information. This is all from Stephen Meyer's book, Darwin's Doubt. If you there it is. Stephen Meyer, known intelligent design proponent. Let's talk a little bit about what kind of change little DNA changes can actually create. In Neil Shubin's excellent text, Your Inner Fish, he tackles pretty much every kind of how do you get a new XYZ question that someone like Frank Turek 
could ever ask. One of my favorites has to do with an experiment that he's describing that occurred in trying to get digits to develop in something like a shark or a ray by using specific genes for digit formation that are found in mice. That's my favorite thing about your inner fish is that every time he's talking about how we get a new XYZ, he backs up his claim with real time experiments that have been performed in the modern day in laboratories. In an experiment described on digit formation, scientists took a bead of sonic hedgehog protein, which is responsible for digit formation in mice, and they stuck it into something that has no digits at all, a shark and a stingray. These things instead have long rays that extend outward in a complicated fashion, as you can see here, over here on what would be your left. Once this gene is implemented, though, into these organisms, all of a sudden we see a mirroring effect, and the rays take on different lengths. This is what fingers do, and is precisely the process that occurs in the formation of fingers in organisms that have them. This same experiment has been performed numerous times on other organisms too, where we take sort of a patch of cells and we stick it into a new animal, or we stick it into a different part of that same existing animal. This was done with fruit flies, where the cell patch that's responsible for making legs was stuck up where the antenna goes, and it grew a leg where the antenna typically grows. The fact that our modern body plans are simply tweaked versions of more primitive body plans can be seen by the fact that our Hox genes have sort of analogous versions in other more primitive organisms. What Neil Shubin has done here is shown a side by side of a sea anemone, its hox genes, and the equivalent hox genes in a human. The point here is that extensive laboratory work, which is the kind of work that creationists like Frank Turek tend to accept, has shown us that minor tweaks in more primitive body plans can lead to very unique novel results in other organisms. Yeah, go off, Frankie, tell us some more. If you want to go further, there's irreducible complexity, which shows that it's very difficult, or it seems virtually impossible, to create these new body plans in gradual ways, because you need all of the body plan and all the parts together in one place at one time to have function. For example, you can't have flight on a bird if you only have half a wing. You won't even get flight if you have 90% of a wing. You need 100% of a wing. So how do you get flight in a bird if you only have half a wing? You don't, the, 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 the creature wouldn't live. This is a really bad example because we have flightless birds, right? <laughs> Now, there are two kind of ideas about how bird flight developed. The sort of bottom-up method, which is where birds started on the ground using their wings as sort of a, a powered flight mechanism for whatever reason. Maybe they're jumping around trying to catch bugs. Very few people like that method. And then there's the top-down method, which is where birds are already living in sort of small canopy environments where they're using their wings to glide. Hmm, what organisms do we know of today that glide and don't fly? The answer is a lot of them. This seems to be a super common strategy by organisms that are already tree dwelling. There are an enormous variety of gliding organisms from flying squirrels to flying snakes to flying frogs, flying fish, squid that will leap out of the water and use their increased surface area to kind of get a little bit of air time. That's, that's cool. That's awesome. And in the animals that are living terrestrially, it seems like they've got one thing in common. They're using this flight to either escape predators or chase after prey. My, that seems like a pretty strong selective force, doesn't it? This idea of half a wing is such a ridiculous idea, and it was covered in a book called Why Evolution is True by Jerry Coyne. And in it, he discusses how evolution never claims that there's going to be half a wing in the sense that Frank is pointing it out. In fact, evolution makes a pretty clear prediction. Every stage of a transition from one thing to another thing, whether it's minor body plans or something much more simple, has to be beneficial to the organism and provide it some kind of fitness benefit. It's no surprise then that when we look at the evolution of flight, whether it's flight in insects, whether it's flight in pterosaurs or bats or birds, they do seem to follow a similar trajectory, which suggests to me anyways that we're seeing some kind of definitive relationship, a true benefit of flight, and indeed every single transitional form therein of which we have, at least in the case of pterosaurs, birds, and insects, a great many. 
So Frank is strawmanning evolution. He's creating a version of the idea that just simply doesn't exist. This idea of half a wing is silly. And if you ever hear anybody say it, you should say that uh, that's not what evolution says. Evolution's challenge is much harder because every stage, again, has to be beneficial fitness-wise to the organism in some way. But I digress. Let's let Frank continue. If it only had half of a wing. So there's irreducibly complex aspects to biology that seems to prevent a gradual, non-intelligent process that brings forth new body plans. And all this is in stealing from God, and if you really want to get the depth for it, you need to go to uh, Darwin's Doubt, which is Stephen Meyer's hernia-inducing volume about this big. That's really funny, Frank, but uh, Darwin's Doubt didn't get a whole lot of traction because it's not full of a whole lot of novel <laughs> ideas. But at least we got some nice suggested videos. What if I'm mad at God and it's like Hulk being angry and then is abortion just the last resort? But abortion is spelled in a weird way. I, I don't know if he's trying to be like quippy or if that's like a cool thing that teens do now. I'm not really sure. What I am sure of is that Frank Turek does not understand evolution very well. In fact, he actually understands it significantly worse than some young earth creationists I know uh, which is seriously saying something, because young Earth creationists aren't typically known for, this is not to say it's a general rule, but they're not typically known for nailing the definition of evolution. So I thought, you know, that's probably enough Frank Turek. Uh, as you guys know, I'm continually inducing ulcers in my gastrointestinal system by consuming uh, creationism content. But that being said, I thought it'd be funny to check out some of the comments and see what's going on. We've got... <laughs> I'm a Christian, but also a biologist, and there is good evidence-based explanations for the evolution of things like wings, eyes, etc. Good for you, Colm. I'm glad that you're here representing conventional science. We've got Craig McGrath saying, I'm excited for Frank to get his PhD in biology and then talk about this again. <laughs> Night Owl says, this guy and Ben Shapiro on a mission could wreck all liberals and atheists. My absolute nightmare is being locked in a room with Frank Turk and Ben Shapiro. Richard was lost. Jesus found me says always define the word evolution beforehand. You'll win the argument every time. Micro evolution happens. The other six definitions are religious. Oh no, there's a Kent Hovind stand here in the comments. <laughs> Animals always reproduce after their kind. Here we use type Richard, that's the word that Frank preferred, so let's stick with the uh, program, okay? Hodo Drumpf says, hard to argue with Frank. Is it? <laughs> we have uh, Adonis Muhoza who says, his ignorance is more astonishing than his argument. Boy, I might have to agree with that as, uh, as savage as it may be. Animals can't evolve by themselves. We've seen it with Magikarp. Airtight. Frank finds it difficult to accept evolution. He has a more real reasonable explanation. Magic. <laughs> Only fi over 5,000 languages, but not one evolved from monkeys. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my God. Anyways, this is all pretty funny. I think this is a, 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 was a fun thing for us to kind of do uh, together. If you scroll down deep enough, you get to... Uh, you get to the real dregs. We have Kent Hovind has many good points on evolution. Thank you, Truth Teller. We also have uh, Michael Ramos. The Earth is flat. Debate over. So Frank, if you want to come back over to our team. <laughs> we have, if Charles Darwin was so smart on evolution and genetics, why did he marry his first cousin? Uh, Steph is out here roasting a dead man who didn't know what genetics was. So really, really good job there. <laughs> Shut up with love, biology. <laughs> so folks, thanks for hanging out with me today. I had a good time, kind of, but maybe we'll look at some Frank Turek uh, shenanigans at another juncture if we need the content that desperately. The thing about Frank is uh, he's all the incompetence of some of the young earth creationists that I see bopping around. Um, and honestly, that's all I really have to say about it. I was going to say he's less funny, but then I started thinking about some of the YECs that I know and regularly uh, brush elbows with. And, and I would say that Frank is about equally as funny. 
which that should really give you something to think about if, if you're perhaps one of those YECs that I just mentioned. So folks, please do take care of yourselves out there, and I'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.